Welcome back to the One Million Dollar Tipping Point Podcast. Today we have Suzanne Breistel here for this interview. And I want to remind everyone, we're brought to you by the Tipping Jar of Wisdom, where as a subscriber, you get access to exclusive content every Thursday straight to your inbox with actionable tasks from our guests that will help you grow your own business. So head over and connect with me on Instagram at Virtually Kiri or LinkedIn, Kiri Mohan, and sign up through my bios. So again, today, Suzanne Breistel. She brings a unique perspective to building your career and leading others in the workplace with analogies to personal dating, relationships, and breakups. Growing up, entering the workforce by request at 13, and then at 20, starting her professional career in small town America with no set plan, she firsthand can share with others how both personal and professional self-discovery opens doors you never thought possible. Suzanne discovered through faith, family, mentors, counselors, coaches, and friends, how minor changes in our perspective can make major changes in our lives. Suzanne's current business provides career matchmaking and coaching services to professionals in construction management and real estate development, an industry filled with behavioral and corporate challenges. Suzanne Breistel has conducted thousands of interviews over the last three decades, uniting employers and employees as a successful career matchmaker and coach. Early on, Suzanne recognized the similarities between personal dating and selecting a meaningful career match. This led Suzanne to develop her proven method of dating for jobs, quote unquote, called the Bristol Method. When hiring managers and job seekers take the time to follow a dating process and both openly participate, it produces a happy workplace union. So thank you so much for being on the show, Suzanne. I'm so happy to have you on. Thanks, Carrie, for having me on the show. I'm very curious about this dating process that you're talking about with your method, because honestly, when I started my business, I wrote one blog post that actually had the most traction. And it was about how, you know, marketing or like something about like initial sales is like dating. And it felt like a lot to me, like trying to find and like flirting with them and trying to get this right magic. And like, what are they hiding? What's real? You know, all that. So talk to me a little bit about this method that you've developed and how it's like dating. So the process takes the candidate through discovering about themselves, because if you can articulate what your needs are and, and what the next step is in your career and what fits into your personal life and in your life in general, all of the different um, um, goals that you have set out for you, you can better articulate that to somebody that you're interviewing with. And a lot of times what happens is people try to mirror themselves, just like in dating, they try to mirror themselves to what the employer's looking for, where employers are looking for um, a baseline and that you are going to come in and be able to do the job, but skill can be taught, attitude and aptitude can. So they're looking for somebody to be genuine with, hey, this is what I'm good at. This is what I might need some extra support in. This is what no different than when you're dating somebody. If you're someone that, um, you know, isn't gifted necessarily at housekeeping, you probably want to tell um, you know, your significant other, if they expect to come home to a perfectly clean house every night, if they marry you, it's probably not going to happen without a housekeeper. So those are the type of things that I've discovered through looking at both sides, what people, and it has to do with mutual expectations and setting mutual expectations that are not, um, thinking because you heard something on interview that that's the way it's going to be having being bold enough to clarify is that what it's going to be or take it through a process to be able to see because a picture is worth a thousand words of um, you know seeing if it's if it's reality because talk is cheap I have a lot of sayings that you'll see that you know that are there and verify don't justify don't go hey they have a beautiful office so they might be a great place to work a beautiful office has nothing to do with whether it's a great place to work or not, or a great place for you to work. You know, so those are the things that, um, you know, like right now we have a lot of people that are looking to be remote in, 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 in remote workplace. But my question back to them is why 
do you want to work remotely? And, and if you find out, well, they're commuting, it's because their commute right now is in, you know, good hour in traffic, maybe longer. Well, do you think the solution for your career is to go remote? Or do you think the solution for your career might be to find something closer to home or something that offers a hybrid model? Because it's much different if they need to work remotely because of, um, you know, a situation that um, they can't interact with people, you know, mm. for, you know, or something, something to do with that. So that's our whole process. And what we do is work with both sides through discovery of, um, through not just them, we, we actually, by the time somebody goes before an employer, they have a resume project list, three to five completed reference checks, um, a disc assessment, which shows their inborn communication style, and then a write-up on, you know, this is why that person is looking to make a move. And, and everybody we deal with is currently employed. And we do that purposely because they're in a position to say no. And, you know, some of my analogies that go along with dating are when you're single, people might look a little better to you than they would yeah. if you know, if you're committed and secure in yourself. So the same thing with, with employment, you don't want to be seeing things through lens thrafters glasses. If it's not reality, you want to really be looking at what's the right situation for you. So that's what I built my business around. And, and, um, and it's, um, we, we have, we're having our 20 year anniversary next year. Wow. And uh, yes. Uh, Congrats. Yes. Thank you. And um, have you ever worked with anyone then who is out of a job? It sounded like you were just working with people who are currently employed. Do you work with people who are yeah, out of a job? I, well, we have a motto here. We help everybody, even if we help them to get, and then I have the coaching side. So we have the career coaching side. So a lot of times if they are, you know, are unemployed, I like to say we help them find a job and then we work with them for the right timing to find a career. So okay. oh, I like that. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> is it, okay. is it hard sometimes? Cause I feel like it was there, there, you can get into a mindset um, when you're seeking a job and you've been unemployed where you just want to take anything, right? Anything that comes your way. Cause you need the money. Right. And like, so listening to your method, I feel like people, some people might bulk and say, no, I'm going to make myself look like the perfect candidate for the employer. Even if I cannot do X, Y, Z, or that's not my strength, right. I'm going to say I can, cause I need this job. Do you encounter that at all? Yeah, and that's and that's human nature. So human nature, like I said, if if they don't have something, they want it. Okay, doing it. Where if they have something that they don't necessarily have to leave, but they have specific career goals, then both sides have skin in the game. And that's the piece that we do with the currently employed people is because we believe if it's something that can be corrected within their current workplace, it's a conversation, not a resignation. And we coach people through that also, because timing is everything. And, and that's what preserves that, you know, mutual farewell. Because if you can walk in and tell your boss, you're leaving to achieve something you can't with them, then there's no reason for a counter offer. There's no reason for anything. It's, it's a goal that you have. And, and hopefully they're appreciative of what you've done to date. And you're also working with them on the timing to help them to not have a gap. That's the relationship piece where sometimes it takes a, you know, you're like in the construction industry, we, we encourage that they don't leave in the middle of a project because that can hurt a project, the historical data. So time at where you're getting ready to make a move when they're in the closeout phase and make sure that your new employer knows that you still need to be available for questions and, and, and what, what that will look like. But you also keep that as a reference you know, moving forward, because somebody can say, no, he did a great job, put the bow in the package, but now they want to move up to Orlando from Fort Lauderdale. And obviously we don't have anything for them in Orlando because we're based here. And those are the type of things that, um, that we're doing all day long and working with people and asking questions to help them to discover, because once you can figure out the patterns, um, you know, in your, in your work 
work life per se that both affect your personal life because they're both the you know and we and I run some you know the philosophy of God first family second everything else comes together including your you know your employment so you know there are going to be commitments with your employer and there's going to be commitments with your family and you should be able to communicate with both to talk through those cycles of, of what that happens and, and build those relationships. So that's the piece where, in, and because of the industry that I service, if somebody's not married to somebody within the industry, automatically they're like, you have to work all those hours because it's a typical, but everything's done on time, budget, schedule, and you have crunch time. So you have critical path within the schedule that you might put in extra hours. So we encourage people to have the conversations with their family members about what that will look like. And, you know, this, and when I get done, I'm going to, you know, we're, we're going to have this vacation planned or we're going to do whatever else and then stick with your commitment to do that also. And, and those are the things that we're working through all day long in both the workplace and, and, um, you know, from to match on the personal side and when we do make a match because it's gone through a minimum of two you know two face-to-face -face interviews everything we've checked the references everything's gone when both the employer and and the new the individual seeking that next opportunity take time to go through that process and verify versus justify then when we're we do follow through on what we call the honeymoon so we follow through we check in with the candidate at the end of the first day and the first week, 30, 60, 90, and we listen for what might have been different or what they're, and then we, we are working with the employer, whoever the hiring manager is, um, to say, hey, you know, they're struggling a little bit with this person's personality. Maybe you want to, you know, take them both to lunch or whatever else to get through the you know, that phase. And, and mo most of the time, if they can get through the 90 days where both did not, um, where they were both honest with one another through that process, they can ramp up and, and they're with them until something happens from a business standpoint, or from a personal standpoint that affects where the business can't sustain their personal side, you know, to do it. So you have so Excellent. much knowledge on this. Like it could, you could tell that you have like this 20 years of experience with this. How did you actually get to this point? Because you're, you know, when I read about you, you said you started at 13, small town in America. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you even got into this specific career. Because it's very, very like a niche that's very, you know, recruiting is not something you would go to college for or school for or anything like that. Talk to us about your path. Okay. So um, at 13, I wanted to go to work. I like one, you know, in making an income, having independence and, and two. So I went to work at my, um, my great uncle's uh, Italian restaurant and I wanted to waitress. And of course I got my first um, school of hard knocks where he said, oh no, you can't waitress till you're 18 and ended up doing dishes and salad prep in the kitchen. But I got to really observe and see you know, people at a young age that the the many of them, you know, people would look down and go, you know, they're doing they're working in the kitchen of a restaurant. So many of them loved it, and it was their job, and they they loved going to work doing that every day, and they didn't see it as something that the rest of the world saw that, hey, they're not a doctor, they're not a lawyer, they're not, this was their calling. I mean, this is what they, they were, you know, they were doing and they would show up and, and love doing it all day long. And then I also just at that age, for whatever reason, was attracted to um, doing things that involve people. So I worked, I did, I worked at the movie theater as a popcorn, you know, doing everything because it was small town. So you do everything from counter sales to cleaning the theater to, you know, everything that runs the two theater, the two seat, you know, the two um, theater, um, uh, I guess, 
two screen theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're you, saying. Yeah, you, you get where I'm going because yeah, now, yeah. I'm, now I'm in big world, you know, where <laughs> you know it's 30 screens. But um, and then you um and and I worked at one of the upscale department stores downtown and and I actually worked, believe it or not, in the lingerie department. So that was rather fascinating to to uh, as a teenager to see how people reacted and thought you know, coming to buy pajamas and things for their loved ones, um, you know, particularly men, I'm like, you can actually touch it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause you, <laughs> you know, you see different things. You also learn a lot of lessons. Like I remember, um, um, and they had in those back in the eighties, they had the upstairs and then they had the tube system that you paid with putting the money in the tube system and sending it up to the office. And they also would watch the whole store from up above in the kind of like you see in some of the publics now, if you see their offices are behind glass door and they can see the, you know, the whole store. Yes. And, um, and so I remember distinctly a lady came in one day and she literally looked like she had come out of the mountains and and um off the you know now we would look at them and think that they possibly were a homeless person and and the phone rings in my department and it was the owner of the store and he said he said I want you to not judge a book by its cover and I want you to just treat her with the utmost because she's one of our best customers. She comes in once a year and buys for her whole family for, for Christmas. And sure enough, that lady walked out with thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, you know, merchandise. And she went there because it was simple and she could get it all gift wrapped and, 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 you know, and that type of thing. And she didn't need to prove to anybody who she who she was. I mean, she, you know, she had, she was self-made herself. And, and I think some of those experiences going, and then, um, and I had lots of other things. I ran, I got involved in networking groups back, if you know, BNI nowadays, but back then it was Allie Lawson's who started actually networking on a national basis. She was based out of Carlsbad, California. And I, I got involved in a chapter that was going on in New England. And then um, when I moved to Florida, I called her up and I said, um, you know, where's your chapter here? I'm now in a huge marketplace, you know, in Fort Lauderdale, where's your chapter? And, and they said, well, we actually don't have one, but you'd be a great person to start one. So I didn't just start one. I ended up starting six. I had two in each county. And, and that's just a little on my personality. So you can see, you know, over the years, I've learned less is more, but that was kind of the foundation that I, that I put in to do that. And then I did commercial interiors. Well, I should say, skipping in high school, I ended up going through a trade program. Uh, it was called pre-engineering graphics, which combined building trades, architecture, and engineering. And it was me and one other one other girl and all the rest were guys. So I just was, a, I guess, a trendsetter, you know, in a in a different um, place there. And then that's what got me launched into commercial interiors. And I did commercial business interiors for until I ended up, uh, and even when, after I moved to Florida with my ex-husband, who was a millwork contractor. And, um, and then we, um, and then I, over time, that was not working for my family because the industry was a road, you know, you traveled a lot in, in that industry. So I decided to compromise and start a small business and, and I brokered products from the state of Vermont and started a business called A Taste of Vermont. And I found that um, I just had this problem with not being able to do anything small and <laughs> I, before I knew it, I was uh, partnered with a brokerage firm and we had a million dollar deal on the plate with Office Depot and to do gift baskets for the holidays. And, and then that was during the time that Staples was buying them and there was going to be a merger and the president of Staples came in, put a hold on that. And I really wasn't enjoying it. I had gone from um, what I had done to help the, you know, the, um, um, the cottage industry in Vermont and, and, and 
you, you know, my creative side, you know, making and designing the gift baskets to now having to do 500, a thousand of the same ones. And it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't. And these are some of the lessons that you learn when you, um, that now I can, I can help. And I ended up, you know, good turning, selling that portion out to the brokerage firm and, and, and then coming back to volunteer so that I just ran the networking groups for a whole year, worked on myself personally and volunteered at both the church and some other organizations. And, and I tell everybody that was the year I made the least amount of money. I think I made maybe $15,000 that year and believe it or not, and, and gained the most wealth. Does that make, if that makes sense to anybody and and that was my and then when the timing was right and and I was right myself I ended up in a staffing agency to and to hopefully go back into the construction industry and ended up them going you need to start a construction desk that you know a construction desk for us and I'm like and, you know, and, and I had had a lot of bad experiences with recruiters that had sent me on, you know, job interviews that I didn't want to go for and some other things. And so it took me seven interviews to try it part time. And of course, I made more money that first month, which I say is a God thing that I made the in the whole year before. And um, and then I was in their their top um I meet their million dollar club over the next six years. And, and then they, they did things differently where the national, it was a division of 200, a national company, 270 offices. And I worked for a local franchisee who gave me some autonomy, but corporate was very big on what I call pushing paper. And I was all about people. So there was always that that disconnect. And I went through a period of um, where my first marriage did not work out. And I was a single mom. So when you're making that money, and you're a single mom, you don't rock the boat, you know, you kind of keep doing it knowing that there'll be a, you know, a day that you'll, you know, that you'll be blessed for, you know, your, your faithfulness to, to others. And sure enough, when I ended up getting remarried, because of my personal situation, we were now a blended family of, of, um, of, three daughters still at home and then and then my stepdaughter uh, in college and we needed somebody because my husband was worked in Miami and we lived up in 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 um, which about an hour north somebody that could be consistent and so that's when I put an offer on the plate to buy out the division and I took the home the business into a home-based business with assistance coming to my home office we bought a we bought a house that had a a double office attached and that's how I started Florida Construction Connection and then and then over over time grew the business with the coaching side and a business partner and at one time I had an online um I say LinkedIn before LinkedIn which is and that could be another whole pod, podcast but I think true entrepreneurs you know, they're not afraid to take risk. And, and then they learn over, you know, over time, how to manage and balance that risk. I like that. That's a, that is a varied career. And one thing I've heard that's kind of a theme when I was listening to you was how interested you were in people, which kind of comes back to like what you're currently, what we've been doing for 20 years, right? Is like you have to know people and be good at reading people and understanding what motivates them, I think, to be successful in a recruiting position. Would you agree? Yeah. And and I don't like the word, you know, recruiting. I guess that's one of the things that you'll find with my business that's a little bit different. And that's why we've rebranded to career matchmaking. And how that happened is I actually had a, a um, um, we had gone under the talent acquisition instead of instead of um, recruiter model with Florida Construction Connection and I had and I hired a um, a 
top employee that um, had worked for a traditional recruitment firm for one year. And, and I fell in love with her when she sat in my conference room and went and I, I said, so why, why are you sitting in front of me and, and not, you know, working for the recruiting, but want to leave the recruiting firm? And she said, because they, it doesn't matter what people say, they have to meet a quota and they're pushing to get that job filled. So whatever job they have, they're trying to get, you know, that job filled. But even if they fill it with the wrong person or they change that person, you know, get that, talk that person into doing it. And it was a sales approach. And, and that was the same thing why I wanted to buy out my division because I was constantly fighting the numbers, you know, the KPIs and meeting the numbers with the national staffing firm versus meeting the people and trusting that when it's meant to be, it all comes together. And, and what happened was, of course, I was able to prove that with time because I was doing higher volume than those that were pushing paper and, you know, from, you know, from that side. And, and part of it is, is because you're not selling anybody on anything. You're getting, the, you're, you know, you're making introductions and then you're mediating that process through the whole thing. So she came back and said, um, I think she's the one that originally um, said, you know, we're really career matchmakers. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you're on to this. <laughs> and, and that's when we started with the whole, you know, changing everything and, and utilizing that. And that I'm going to say that was maybe eight or nine years ago somewhere there and then and then the whole programs kind of come together with what I call writing the recipes and getting it down and being able to track now the the KPIs behind it and when we did have what we call follow-offs where people did start a position and the position didn't turn out to be what it was either one side or the other who changed the plan or wasn't honest with one another and you know and you can you can look at that and manage risk from you know from a different side so it's 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 a it's fascinating but it all does come down to people and and being and not really me um I guess I guess my love of people is wanting them to make to be able to to identify and make smarter decisions so that they can have a better life, just like, you know, and, you know, I've been blessed with over mm -hmm. over time. And I think I, you know, I see that in other people where who you were yesterday doesn't define who you're going to be tomorrow. And and that's probably one of the biggest things that we do here. So when you hit seven figures and you hit that a million dollars. Um, what do you think was the most important action you took to grow your business to a million dollars? I mean, because you just have a myriad of different business experiences here, selling, buying, offers. What was you think? What do you think was that most important action that you took? Um, I think not focusing on the money. Okay, I focused on doing what was right and following the plan, consistently consistent, and the money came. And I think that's, that's the best advice that I, you know, can give somebody that wants to do a million dollars or more, you know, you can't be everything to everyone, you, you have to clearly focus on, and then you have to look at different markets. And I do that with companies nowadays, somebody in the construction industry might start out with, um, you know, doing healthcare construction, and they might do very well in the healthcare arena and the healthcare marketplace. And now they want to grow their company, you know, the craziest thing they can do is move into high rise, because it's to different people, different processes, different, you know, and they don't know enough about that um you know from you know from that standpoint so i get them to think about how they can build on their business and but keep the sustainable growth and not and utilize the same resources versus having to have different sets of resources with and that's why when you get into companies that large corporations they have separate divisions that service separate industries because they're very uniquely different and that allows them to mold themselves around, you know, in service 
you know, the industry that they and hire people that are passionate about whatever industry that is. What do you think has been the best investment you've made with in your business? Oh, ah, that's the best investment has probably been in both people and technology. Okay. So investing in, you know, giving people opportunity that um, may not have been or giving them financially sometimes more than what was in the budget, but seeing what could be, you know, what that was going to do you know, to the business, the business in their life, you know, from that side, where I think that's when you get into employment, I'll just let you know, that's what we run into a lot when eight, when you have to introduce. So HR can be extremely valuable. And then HR can be very challenging, you know, human resources, because if they're so set in stone that everything has to be Exactly. And and sometimes the larger corporations are, it's compliance, you know, they have to do it from a compliance standpoint, but you can really, if you can have no flexibility whatsoever in how you can structure something or get somebody where, um, where they need to be, um, you're going to eventually lose them anyway. So you either or you're going to or that position is going to stay open. So right now, like I have a saying that I I notice a lot in our industry, we don't necessarily have a shortage of like construction managers, per se, in the construction industry. We have a shortage of properly educated construction managers because only 35 percent of them, of course, have any the formal educational side of construction management. And then we have a shortage of what I call professionally developed construction managers that have both their personal life and their professional life where they can be committed. So we have a lot of job hoppers that think when something goes wrong, it's it's because the employer and they, or or because their financials at their personal side, they don't know how to manage their financials. And so by switching jobs, they might get a sign-on bonus or they might get extra whatever that solves their temporary, but it doesn't fix their career and help them. And, and you know, it's, it's that, you know, I call them job, there's job addicts too, okay, that are that thing job addicts. That. I like that. Like the people that just jump around. Yeah. Job addicts. That's so okay. good. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at their resume and then, you, and then I sit and go, how come employers keep hiring them? Okay. What is, and that's because those employers, okay, are desperate for somebody. So they, they run the somebody's better than nobody type thing, but the reality it isn't. Okay. Because if it's, it, you know, that's, that's where, you know, the right people in the right seats at the right time, you know, make all the difference in the, you know, in the world and, you know, to running a business because you can love and that, and that's probably the biggest piece with me is I believe, and I tell every person that works here too, that I love you as a person, but I, I also have a business to run. And so, and you have responsibilities, so I can love you, but if you're not doing your responsibilities, I'm doing an in-service to everybody else by, you know, by allowing you to not do your job. And, and so those are, and it's the same thing in parenting, okay? If you're not holding your children accountable, you ultimately are doing a disservice to, you know, other people around you. And those are some of the analogies and things that are going, and it's hard. I mean, it's very, that saying it's lonely at the top. I mean, anybody who owns a business knows it's lonely at the top because there's times when your heart and your head, okay, are not in alignment and you have to have both of them in alignment and um, so one of my articles that we just, I write a blog every week, a custom blog, 
and for the industry, for the construction industry. And some of them are generic. And I believe uh, marketing right now is working to um, rewrite, help me to get them so they're more generic for all industries and for the happily married to your employer um, blog that's coming up. And, um, and so that what what I wrote about re recently republished was one that I wrote in 2017 called Greed to Achieve. And it talks about how all the different ways in the workplace that you need to grieve and take time to grieve. Like if somebody, we just had an employee leave that was with us for five years and we we love her, wonderful, but she had personal, she aspirations and she has a 92 year old father that she needs to care for and and it affects you know what because we service an industry of course that we need to have regular hours and and doing that we weren't you know we can't necessarily accommodate that and and all of us here the first you know the week after she left there was a void there is a big void and we all had to talk about that and we had to talk about you know what that looks like and the fact that we can all stay in touch with her personally and and you can you know you can do that but also where the boundaries are of what stays just like a, in a family, what the boundaries are that stay within the family and what the boundaries are, you know, that because they're now not going to have it in day-to-day -day context, okay? It's different when somebody's coming in your door every day and you say something to them, it's in context, but when somebody leaves your company, you know, you might not be able to talk to them about what went wrong on a project or what went wrong on whatever else, because they're not going to handle it the same way. And if it hits the street, that's where your marketing and your PR, you know, come in. So those are some of the things that we, you know, that I, you know, have experienced myself and had to go through. And then I try to, you know, put them in writing. That's, and to share with other people. And now we're trying to do more podcasts and videos. And, and uh, for years and years, I've heard you should write a book. So I have a book, you know, coming out and it's on pre-sale right now. And then the actual book is out um, to 2323. And, um, and it's, you know, dealing with a lot of the misconceptions that happen in the workplace. Yes. And the book is called Happily Married to Your Employer, which we will go into a little bit later on. Um, tell me who or what position was your first hire? Um, you mean on the, um, in the business mm -hmm. or, or you mean that I hired? For, for in this specific business or, that you hired. That I hired. I know because okay. you, you also do like the employer matchmaking. No, I meant okay. Okay. for your business, who was, who or what position was your first hire? Okay. My first uh, hire was a, uh, you know, a, a assistant. Okay. That, that can, um, really did everything in the beginning. They worked with helping me with um, both, you know, clients and candidates and admin. And, and uh, my mother was actually my part-time bookkeeper in the beginning. And I think a lot of people, you know, start out with, you know, the family, family side of it. And then my husband did help with a lot of structuring because I call him the spreadsheet king. And uh, so he helped with a lot of the, you know, the setup on some of the, we have like what's called the big picture report and things like that, that he developed that, that think of it as the dashboard for the whole business that you can look at, you know, very quickly. And, and, um, and then I've always had, um, and then we grew to two assistants and then one of them started doing more marketing and the other one started doing more, you know, um, front facing and follow up. And then uh, eventually we split the positions into having what um, we, you know, the talent acquisition specialists that were helping with the candidate side. And then, um, at, you know, we grew with different and now we have a whole program where we work as a team and nobody and everybody's on bonus instead of commission. And so that incentivizes them to one, get the right people and two, for every department, I call it the human body to, you know, to work together and, um, and make sure. So marketing, so how marketing looks at if they're being successful or not is 
is, did they do anything to help us make a match or coach somebody today to take them to the next level? And, and so that's how, you know, we look at it from a marketing perspective. We look at it from a administrative perspective. Did you, um, did you follow up professionally and did you follow up within the program and, 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 um, and, and follow what needs to be done so that they have had a good experience and then the back of the house is all about making sure the rest of us don't have to worry about anything to do with the HR, the office management, you know, um, coming in, all the holidays switched out, all the different things that you you don't think about when you're running, you know, when you start a business, but those are all the things if, um, you know, little things like even on Friday, one of the blinds, one of the little slats in the blinds fell fell off in one of the rooms and we're in sunny South Florida. And so that particular slat happened to now has sunshine in somebody's face, uh, um, you know, that they have to do, but we have somebody who will have that all taken care of with property management. And, you know, so those are all the things that, you know, from a cultural standpoint, that's what we kind of work the bonus program. So if, if they're um, not coming up with solutions to help, which our ultimate goal is to match the right people with the right companies and, and make sure that they have, and then to help others on the coaching side to build, to identify and to be able to go out and, and uh, build their careers. And if we don't, if they're not doing something that's helping towards that, then why are they doing, you know, then what is the purpose behind it? What do you think is the percentage of your business right now that coaches and helps people with their careers versus the matchmaking? So the coaching for the matchmaking is done with every candidate that we're matching. Oh, okay. They come here, they automatically are getting that service as we're working them through. And then, and then I'll right now only about um, on the paid coaching side, because what happened was with, with COVID, we put a good share of that on hold. I used to have actual, what we called integrators, which were people that were partners with our, us that came into the coaching center and they did that side of the business. And then um, we're only doing it right now on demand. And we do um, in, because what we've been working on is scaling and taking to the next level, the career matchmaking side before we, we go back and, and um, gear up on, on getting hot and heavy on the, and that's my whole deal about building a business is if you start getting spread too thin, you start seeing where the monetization side can be affected unless you have somebody who 100% can step in and do it in the same, um, the same format. So I'd say 90%, 90 to 10 right now, 90% on the, the paid um, career matchmaking and 10% on the paid um, coaching. Uh, what is your long-term plan for your business? Where are you look, what are you looking to do? Have you thought about selling it? Have you thought of an exit plan or are you just, you know, got your book right now and you're going to keep reaching for the stars? Yeah, no, my, my long-term goal is to be able to scale and help more people and to get the programs that we deliver um, you know, all tied into, um, you know, if you haven't read the e-myth e for, you know, for business. I have read that. Yeah. Okay. So basically that's, that's what we're doing right now. And I have multiple coaches myself that I've worked with four different aspects to take that to the next level. So that then one, we can deliver to more market segments within the construction industry, because we do not cover all market segments within the construction industry because they're vastly different. And then we can also take the model into other industries and help people. But my, my long-term plan is to find where we can help everybody through, excuse me, the right resources to, um, to have direction. In, in in their career, have somebody that they can speak with that's going to give them what our model is, sound career advice. 
And because right now I'm an expert in the construction industry and the management side, I'm, you know, I'm, we're focused on that. And that's the industry that, um, you know, I'm, I'm called to help. And, um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm talking to some other people that are in other industries that see that this could be a crossover program for them, you know, down the road as we, you know, as we scale. So that's, that's the plan. And, and so this next year is in um, really what we've done is we've moved the responsibilities that used to be done by a single person, a career matchmaker into now broken into responsibilities with a career matchmaking team. And that allows them to be able to be um, deal, working with more people and it allows us to scale the program to, um, you know, to service the clientele. And I don't know how much you um, follow the, the construction industry, but part of what drove the business to take that angle versus going building the coaching side first was because of the sheer volume that is needed right now in the construction industry because of the amount of building that you know that's going on out there and and the um the lack of i guess resources that have the industry background to be able to tell the difference between somebody that's um, you know, done production homes versus luxury homes and, and, um, or done, um, you know, high rise versus garden style wood frame multifamily. Okay. So those are some of the things that the construction industry has, you know, has challenges with because construction isn't construction and a project manager for one company is not necessarily, um, they could be a superstar in the market segment that they're in because they understand that, but you could move them into another market segment because they want to learn that, but they could really be an assistant project manager because there's such a big learning curve. And so that's some of the stuff that we've, you know, why that's driven us to focus more on helping the industry where the need is. What advice do you have for women who are trying to grow their business to seven figures? Um, and why do you think some women can't quite get there? Um, I think, so we implemented, um, I can't even tell you how many years back now, but consistently consistent. And as the, and, and that's made a big difference because I think, yeah, you know, women, tend, you know, it's that spaghetti brain versus the, you know, where we tend to, um, you know, think with things intertwined versus necessarily, you know, the I happen to be in the dominant category. So I'm a process thinker, you know, from that side, but then, and then, but I, but I also am very creative. So when you get that and you blend, you know, you want to be everything to everyone and you can't. So if the best advice I can get is to be clear, get your messaging down and be, um, you know, work in a, a formatted process to grow that and then look at what attaches to that versus going off into another tangent and thinking they're going to meet. Because that's what I see a lot with women in business that you talk to them and they're, you know, you're, they're, they're starting this and they're doing this and they're, you know, they're not staying focused at what one thing and get it. And it goes back to, you can't serve two masters. Okay. You, you really, and that's in business too. You, you know, you can't, and, and yes, yeah, so are there people like Richard Branson that have 400 and some odd businesses and the whole bit, but he doesn't, run the day-to-day -day operations in those businesses. And, and in fact, if you've gone to hear him speak, he hires people that are experts in, in that particular field, passionate about that field, and they're there running that side of it. And he's the big picture visionary, you know, coming in, you know, to, to, you know, to do it from that side. And so when you get to that stage, it's a different story. But when you're building a business, you need to build it just like you're playing, you know, building blocks and, you know, and focus on, you know, on what's happening. And if your foundation isn't shored up, eventually, 
your business and, um, you know, is going to, and that can be anything from, um, you know, we hear a lot of people that put all their eggs in one basket. So they service, you know, they get a big client and that client, you know, gives them all kinds of business and, and keeps, you know, keeps them busy for 10 years. And they're like, oh, that client's doing great. They're never going to go away. And then lo and behold, yep. okay, you see. And then what happens? They have to start over. Happens. and then, Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Where, where if they were looking at balancing out, you know, maybe this client's giving me, you know, 80% of my business, but now I'm going to start building and they start shoring that foundation up. They're ready for, you know, they're ready for a rainy day. And, and so that's, you know, kind of business in, in uh, that I see looking into a lot of other people's businesses every day too. That's where a lot of times, both male or female, they they run into challenges. Have you faced any hurdles specifically as a woman in in business in your specific niche? So that's that's really interesting because I get asked that question a lot, and I I don't with the men. Okay, I tend to a lot of times other women will be more challenging for me than the men themselves. And, and part of it is, is because I don't do business thinking whether I'm male or female or what, but what happens is I myself get uncomfortable if I'm with somebody who's in, you know, a, a female who's insecure with me or can't have a direct conversation. And that could happen because, and I'm working on that. So all of these things, you know, help. That's one of my, you know, one of my career goals. So like, um, you know, 20 years ago when I started the, I got asked to start the um, Women's Council for Associated Builders and Contractors. I, I looked at the um, president at the time and I went, why me? I work with men all day long because, you know, back then there was like four or five percent women in construction management. And, and he said, yeah, because you work well with the men. We want you to bring all the women that work well with the men. And then we team and we do. And I went, oh, OK. And then, of course, it, you know, it, it was not something I was necessarily as used to. And from the emotional standpoint, now, years later, I've developed more over into what I call the empathy side of, you know, and this is studying the different assessments. And, and hopefully I'm a little, a lot warmer than I was 20 years ago from, you know, versus, you know, versus direct and learning how to, um, to do it. I think when women feel like they're being discriminated against, against men, it's a, it's a, they want the men want to understand and it's a communication or the men have a um get uncomfortable too with the emotional side and i don't know if i was just you know made that way to be able to help other women but that's part of what we work with women with right now in in the construction industry too is because they think they're getting overlooked for promotion in in the industry but yet why why are there two because they're a female well then you go look at their company and you're like well there's three other females that are in executive roles here so why would you think that you're getting discriminated against because you're a female okay mm -hmm. that it doesn't make sense they only see what they're looking for do you see the mm -hmm. or a lot of times people want to justify you know, and that's why I, you know, I have a lot in the book, I have a lot of things about, you know, misconceptions in the workplace and, and what really is discrimination, because the reality is, um, you know, that there's not as much as people think there are, what happens is somebody hears something and they turn it into what, and then it triggers all kinds of things, because if you say something to your employer, like you're just saying that because I'm a female, okay, they, in most companies, they now have to report that to HR, okay, do you see what, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay, that this person is now flagged, that they feel like, and I'm not like that at all, and so I don't want to get set up that, 
you know, something and then the company's going, hey, I don't want anything filed against me. And, you know, where if somebody would just focus on if everybody would really focus on their job and what the job is and and doing what their responsibilities are, it wouldn't really matter because everybody's getting what, you know, what they want. And all of us, male or female, have our limitations of, you know, what we can and, and, and then we have our limita limitations on what we will do or what we want to do. You know, so all of that comes into play, no matter, you know, where it is. And, and I placed, I guess, I guess, because I place people, um, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, if I had a, I can't even tell you how many people I've placed over the years that have felonies on their record. Okay. But the difference is, is they sit in an interview and they go, I have a felony from 2014 and this is what it was. And would you like the backup documentation? Okay. Versus the one that checks the box saying, no, I don't have a felony. You and the, the background back. check comes back and yeah. Yes, so it has nothing to do with them having a felony. It has them to do now. They might not be able to work in, you know, in or near a school because of the Jessica Lunsford Act and some of the things that are in place to protect everybody. But that doesn't mean that they they haven't bettered their life and taken it to the next level. But what an employer is really looking at is this person honest and if they learned by their mistake and are they really moving forward to be an open book and did they learn from it or are they somebody who's justifying that comes into the justifying you know versus verifying and you know from that side so when people start to really get to where um you know and I have a made-up word in the um in the book called genuine genuinity and when people can start being really genuine about where they are today and and where they want to be tomorrow, it just opens so many, so many doors for, you know, for opportunity. Tell us a little bit more about your book, where we can find you and um, anything else you want to share with our audience if they want to connect with you. Sure. So happily married to your employer. It com or publishwithnow.com are the two websites. That's the publisher's website and mine. And they can pre-order now. And um, and the book will be in hand to 2323. And it's uh, available um, right now, uh, hard hardcover and in paperback. And then um, in February, it'll be available also on audiobook and um and ebook you know both. and amazon right you said amazon too yep amazon okay. and wherever books are yeah yes. so mm -hmm. what is one philosophy mantra or quote that you try to run your business by well i think i told you consistently consistent mm -hmm. and then you know um day by day because change is inevitable Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing as you like advice that you have for our business owners and your career. And I'm sure people will be able to get a lot of information from this. So we really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I hope to be on again soon. Thanks. Good luck with your book. And we'll definitely put all that in our show notes so that people can find it and buy it when they want to. Thank you.